Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Queen's Free Speaking of Health lecture series. Tonight's lecture is called Brain Aneurysms and Advances in Treatment. I'm Minister Gimoto from the Corporate Communications Office at the Queen's Health Systems. And on behalf of Queen's, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Samuel Sapiti. He's a neurologist at the Queen's Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Sapiti is a neurointerventionalist who specializes in minimally invasive cerebral vascular disorders, such as stroke, brain aneurysms, vascular malformations of the brain and spine, head and neck, as well as atherosclerotic narrowing and blockage of brain and neck vessels. Sorry, I'm really cold here tonight. <laughs> okay. He earned his Master of Science degree in Neuroscience at the University of Louisville and graduated as a Doctor of Medicine from Christian Medical College in Valor. He is board certified in neurology, neurocritical care, and vascular neurology. A warm welcome, please, for Dr. Sapiti. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, taking your time to come and learn more about brain aneurysms. It's one of my uh, favorite topics to talk about. So I will try to make it as uh, non-scientific as possible with a lot of common analogies to, to get the point across. And at any point in time, if you have any questions, please write them down. I'm more than happy to answer all of them at the end of the talk, if not outside. Last but not the least, the more I, uh, more I get excited, the faster I tend to speak. So I will try to be as slow as I can. <laughs> okay. With that in mind, just to kind of go through the initial uh, formalities, I don't have any financial arrangements with any vendors, companies, instrument devices. And all my information provided here, I try to remove every trace of... Uh, uh, what you call uh, company information there as much as possible. And all my uh, information provided today is based on the protocols, based on the consensus in the, you know, in the neurosurgical community as well as practice patterns. So this is kind of coming from experience from colleagues as well as experience in practice as well as the guidelines we're expected to follow. So there's no bias to this. Um, a very small introduction about myself. Um, I only came here last year. Uh, my colleague who trained with me in Atlanta at Emory University, uh, he's, he's the intense, uh, internationalist right here, and he's the one who's been asking me to join him for the last two to three years. And finally, last year, I decided to bite the bullet and came here, and I've been very happy since. So these two of us in this island who are part of the Comprehensive Stroke Center um, in Hawaii, and we have a third partner joining us in October who does some open surgical uh, procedures as well. And I, I can elaborate on those uh, through the slides. And uh, you have some of the handouts. I do have some animations to explain the, the descriptions on the, on the procedures that I talked about. Okay. To start with, what are aneurysms? Um, when people talk about aneurysms, uh, people generalize that to every part of the body. The key thing that I wanted to emphasize here is brain aneurysms are a different beast. People may have aneurysms in the, in the iota, in the thorax, in the abdomen, in other parts of the body, but the brain aneurysms that I'm talking about are a completely different beast. The reason for that is the blood vessels and everywhere else in the body have a certain caliber, integrity, thickness, you know, uh, size and length to it. The moment these arteries pierce the skull base to go into the brain, because you have a thick skull, all of us do, uh, for that reason the vessels don't have to be supported or, or protected as much, so they become a lot more smaller, thinner, and more friable. And that's the reason why these aneurysms are a lot more devastating and a lot more uh, likely to bleed or cause problems. To summarize this one more time, uh, an aneurysm is like a blister. It's, it's like, for example, you buy four new tires for your car. If there's a construction problem in, in the integrity of the tire, you may not see anything when you buy the tires. But as you use the tires for a certain number of miles, you start to see the weakness pop out as a bulge or a blister. That's what aneurysms are, weakness in the blood vessel wall, and in the, in the, especially in the brain. And these may not show up at birth. The youngest age I've seen, someone have an aneurysm is 10 years old, a young girl. The oldest person I've seen an aneurysm is 99 years old. So they can happen at any age, but they do show up later in life. The problem with an aneurysm is they, are, they can be catastrophic or they can be extremely dangerous if they bleed. Um, I'll explain that more in the next few slides with illustrations that will uh, drive home the point. So aneurysms can also form two different ways. Um, there are three layers in a blood vessel wall. You have the outer layer, you have the thick muscular layer, and the thin inner coating. When you have all three layers together, 
thin down and stretch out into an aneurysm, that is called a true aneurysm. And those are the ones oftentimes that are more dangerous. The false aneurysms or, or the Latin term pseudoaneurysm is when you have a loss of integrity of this blood vessel wall. For example, someone had a tear due to a car accident or, or an injury, or someone had um, uh, someone's coughing and then that kind of caused some sort of trauma to them. That caused a vessel tear. So the layers of the uh, blood vessel wall are lost in caliber. And you can have leakage of blood in between those layers causing a bulge or a swelling. Those are the ones that are called pseudoaneurysms. Pseudoaneurysms are not born. Pseudoaneurysms are not uh, developed spontaneously, can happen occasionally, but they are acquired. They are not born like normal cycular aneurysms. And aneurysms come in different shapes and sizes. So the ones that are more dangerous overall are the ones we call cycular, as you can appreciate in uh, the master shanker right here as a bulge. It's on one side of the blood vessel wall. Whereas if the whole aneurysm is in, whole blood vessel is involved, just like a snake, a hungry animal swallows a whole deer or an animal, that's a fusiform aneurysm. Those don't tend to be bleed as much, but they can cause problems as well. And this illustration below is uh, showing you the leakage of an aneurysm. Hopefully it doesn't happen that way, but that's what they gave us. Um, to see how common it is, uh, they're actually very common uh, to the point that in this room, if I have 100 people, six of you will have an aneurysm you may not know about. So it's kind of a scary thought to think about. However, the key thing to remember is, even if you have such a high population with aneurysms, there are not many that actually bleed. The aneurysms that rupture, the ratio they call is approximately one in 500 to one in 1,000 patients with an aneurysm. So it's very rare to bleed. Just because you have it doesn't mean that you'll have to worry about it bleeding. So it can just stay like that for the rest of your life, be a silent partner like the appendix. You know, it's not causing any problems for you. However, if it does bleed, one in four or one in five do not even make it to the hospital on time. They die in seconds to minutes. And overall, the death rate for aneurysm 30 days with a ruptured brain aneurysm is approximately 50%, which is one out of two patients with a ruptured aneurysm would not survive beyond the first 30 days. Not just because of the initial bleed, because of all the sequelae or the complications that happen because of it. So that's the reason why it's a deadly disease. To the point that it's very common, it's very rare to bleed, but if it does bleed, it's really bad. And for that reason, a lot of patients, a lot of people have uh, aneurysms, get concerned about it, and oftentimes treated for it. How do they present? Just like six out of you will have an aneurysm right now. So if you have any of these symptoms, raise your hand. It's more common in women than men. That's one of the unusual things. Uh, it's also uh, uh, seen in 10% of families. And in fact, just for the last one year I've been here, four or five of the patients that I have have family history. And I have treated their, their daughters, their parents. So yes, it is common to have 10%. However, just because you have one aneurysm does not mean that that's the only one you have. There are quite a few patients we see that have more than one, average of two to four, and that's seen in 20% of the time. So if you do have an aneurysm, you have a one in five chance of having more than one. The average age of patients or individuals affected by it, they say on net is 40 to 60 years of age, but like I said, the youngest we had to deal with, a ruptured aneurysm was 10 years old, oldest was 99, so it can happen at any age. The commonest risk factors for patients or people who have aneurysms, number one is uh, smoking. There is something about cigarette smoke. It's the nicotine or the toxic chemicals that are with it that change the caliber and the integrity of the collagen or the elastic tissue in the blood vessel wall. If you couple that along with uncontrolled blood pressure, you have two, essentially like a double shot espresso affecting you. It's it's weakening of the blood vessel wall because of the loss of normal elasticity or normal integrity and add higher blood pressure to it that's constantly pounding on this weakness, causing it to bulge more, is the most common recipe we see for brain aneurysm formation as well as rupture. So what else can cause aneurysms? I'll list just a few of here, uh, but these are the ones that are modifiable, as in you can do something about it. If you're a smoker and you have an aneurysm, it's best to stop, so you don't have to worry about it as much too much. If you have high blood pressure and you have an aneurysm, as long as you keep it controlled, risk is lower. And if you are one of those patients or people who are drug users, such as methamphetamines or cocaine or something else that actually shoots up your blood pressure, yes, the risk is higher. 
And last but not the least, alcohol consumption, not in social amount, binge drinking. Uh, considered seven or eight drinks in a sitting or 15 drinks a week. Those are the ones that are considered higher risk. There are a few other risk factors that we do know. For example, there are patients who have cysts in the kidney and there are patients who have hyperextensible joints due to family history or otherwise. Those are patients who are more likely to have aneurysms develop and form and rupture over time than other population. This, this graphic out here illustrates the multiple locations of the aneurysms. They kind of look like uh, fruits in a tree. As you can appreciate, they are multiple just to show the commonality and the frequency of different locations for these aneurysms. And the, one of the most common factors we notice with aneurysms are they happen more likely in junctions or intersections. Like you have a fork on the road, we have a bifurcation of a blood vessel. Th those pressure points because of the constant flow of blood with, associated with weakness in the blood vessel wall are the most common sites for aneurysm formation. 60 to 70% of aneurysms are seen just in the bifurcations. Unfortunately, most of them are not detected right away. We find out most of these aneurysms incidentally. If somebody has headaches, they have migraines, or they have some concerns of a brain tumor. May I respectfully have to speak a little forward? Okay. Because a lot of older people are getting aneurysms. Yes. Because they have Okay, fair enough. That's fine. Sure. So uh, not all aneurysms are detected right away or are symptomatic. They're picked up, and as I mentioned, 6% of people have it, so they don't know about it. So how do we know if someone has an aneurysm? You can image these people. You can look for other symptoms that can be associated with aneurysms. It's not always, it's not always possible. So the most common symptom of patients or people who have aneurysms or picked up are people with headaches, constant daily headaches or headaches of varying intensity or headaches with associated other symptoms. This particular graphic here shows this, this person with the left eye that's pointing down and out, and the left eye, when you actually lower the eyelid or release the eyelid, it droops down. And this is because this particular aneurysm's location is where a nerve that controls the eye on the left side is inflamed. Um, the nerve is actually inflamed because of the aneurysm pulsations. So this patient did not have a ruptured aneurysm but he had this develop emergently over hours, which was telling us that this was about to rupture because it was rapidly growing, and that's the reason why. So this is one of those presentations that when you have really bad headache with eye problems, that is an emergency. That means it's about to rupture. Go to the hospital or emergency department. There might be people who might have a loss of consciousness or they pass out because of really bad headache. That could be an aneurysm that black. But majority of the time, the most common presentation for aneurysms that are symptomatic are the worst headache of your life. If you had headaches before, whatever reason, if it's the worst headache of your life, you never had a headache like that before. Examples given to me were a heavy weight fell on my head, or like I have an elephant on my head, or my head is about to explode. Those are common descriptions given to us by patients with these, with these symptoms. So when you have a really bad headache, typically listed as 10 out of 10, or the worst headache in your life that you can't stay home, take Tylenol, or do something else to help you with, that is an emergency. Majority of presentations we see with aneurysms are headaches. Unfortunately, some people, especially on blood thinners or uncontrolled blood pressure, or whatever you can call, may present with unresponsiveness. Sitting at a table, eating dinner, watching TV, something else, oh, my head hurts. The next thing you know, they pass out. Loss of consciousness is the second worst presentation. And sometimes, because of that, they might have seizures, they might have other symptoms that can kind of localize that this is a brain aneurysm. So anytime you have someone who complains of a really bad headache and they pass out, that is an emergency. So those are common presentations. Some not so common presentations are progressive loss of vision on one eye, fluctuating presentations, just like a brain tumor grows, an aneurysm can also grow over time, and that can cause some mass effect of pressure in the brain that can present with those symptoms as well. Last but not the least, because of the increased pressure in the brain, there are some patients who complain of progressive nausea and vomiting and blurry vision and very infrequently pulsations in the ears, hearing ringing and pulsations in the ears on one side. All those could potentially point to aneurysms. Any questions so far or any thoughts so far? Am I uh, slowed, slowing down enough? 
I just want to make sure, because I want you guys to get the, the message. Okay. Okay. And next question would be, now that you think you have an aneurysm, what's the best way to diagnose it? Unfortunately, it's a blood vessel problem. So a regular CAT scan, a regular MRI may not show an aneurysm unless it's significantly large in size. Most of the time, we have to do a dedicated vascular study, which is looking at the blood vessels in the brain. And there are three different modalities available in current practice in medicine to look at the blood vessels in the brain. Number one, an MRI scan, the magnetic resonance imaging, where you go through that very claustrophobic tube with the loud banging noise. But the benefit of that study is there is no IV dose or IV medication given, no radiation exposure. It's completely magnetic. The upside of this is it is unless unless you have uh, metal in your body and you cannot get an MRI, this would probably be the, the safest and the lowest risk uh, procedure you can get done to evaluate for aneurysm. And one downside of an MRI or an MRA, what we call it, is if the aneurysm is smaller than three millimeters in size, it may not be reliable because the study resolution is not the best. The way I describe that is, you're, looking, you're sitting at the beach, you're looking at the boats from a distance. With your naked eye, you can make, maybe make up the silhouette of a boat. With binoculars, you can see a little bit more detail. But if you have a high-powered magnified telescope, you can see all the details you need. So the naked eye is an MRI. If you want to look a little bit better, but not get into a higher risk procedure to evaluate for aneurysms, you can get a CAT scan. The upside of a CAT scan is Resolution is much better than MRI. You are given dye, but the only thing you get is an IV. You don't get anything else, just an IV line, contrast given to you, and then you go through radiation for a CAT scan. And the good thing about this is with the newer technologies, anything up to one millimeter or larger can be, can be visualized very well. So that's one of the smallest sizes you can think about. That's the upside of a CT. And that's the binoculars I was talking about. However, the most uh, detailed and comprehensive way you can look at an aneurysm is what I do for a living. It's called an angiogram, just like a heart catheter. I'm sure some of you may have had it. Similarly, we just go either from the wrist or the groin, go through the artery, we go into the neck, inject the dye, and take pictures. And this gives us a resolution up to 1,000 times better than a CAT scan or anything up to 0.1 millimeters in size. So this image here shows a regular CAT scan showing the aneurysm right here with a software reconstruction showing the same aneurysm right here on the right side of this particular brain. And this is a CAT scan. I just want you to compare this image to the next page, which is an actual angiogram. You can appreciate the finer details right here. This is a patient who actually had a ruptured aneurysm right here, and you can see that's the part of rupture, what we call a daughter sac. So these are the details you may not see with a CAT scan, but you will see with an angiogram. So that's the upside of an angiogram. You get the best clarity or the best resolution you can possibly get. And the other benefits of an angiogram, you get much lower dose of dye for the procedure. You get much lower dose of radiation for the procedure. But the downside, it is invasive. You have to get access to the artery. So it is a procedure done in the hospital. So this graphic illustrates here, this, put, this particular mannequin had the angiogram done through the groin going up from the groin through the blood vessels, just like all the blood vessels in the body are connected like a highway system. They go up, straight up into the neck, through, into the brain. And the upside of this procedure also is you can, since you already have access to the blood vessel, you can use this technology to treat. Such as if I'm getting a screening test study for, angi for an aneurysm, do I want a CAT scan if I just want to watch it? Or do I want to get an angiogram so I can get it treated? So. Quite a few patients, when they have an aneurysm by MRI, MRA, would not go for a CAT scan. They want to straight for an angiogram so they can have it fixed as well. And this is, this is the part that I actually wanted to focus on more, uh, treatment for aneurysms. And this scan actually shows a ruptured aneurysm. And what I mean by that is a regular CAT scan would not have all this grayish white appearance in here. And that is actual appearance of blood. Blood doesn't look as bright as bone, but does show up in CAT scans like this. So if anyone has a really bad headache, they go to the emergency department, they get a CAT scan. If this is what they have, that is an emergency. That's a ruptured aneurysm, until otherwise. 
So where do we treat aneurysms? Just because 6% of the population have it, and it's very rare for it to rupture, do we need to treat them? Unless it ruptures. It's a, it's a very good question. The decision or the answer for that depends on the size of the aneurysm, the shape of the aneurysm, the location of the aneurysm, the age of the patient, the overall general health, and the clinical presentation. If someone presents with headaches, someone actually presents with eye symptoms, and it is from the aneurysm, it is causing the problem, so you have to fix it. Somebody has migraines, aneurysm is picked up incidentally, it's not causing the problem, you may not have to treat it. The aneurysm is really small in size, two or three millimeters in size. It's a pretty small size, the risk of fixing it is much higher than leaving it be. So it's best to leave it be. But somebody has an aneurysm that one centimeter in size, who's only 25 or 30 years of age, and they have a lifelong risk of this bleeding annually, you fix it. So all those things are very subjective. It all depends on the health of the person, the age of the person, the clinical presentation, how it was picked up, and last but not the least, you know, overall appearance of the aneurysm. Aneurysm that look very uniform or smooth typically have a lower risk of bleeding. But aneurysms that look bumpy or irregular are already demonstrating weak points with an aneurysm ball. That suggests that they might be able to bleed over time. So those are the ones we fix more aggressively. For the ones that we watch, we just do CAT scans or MRIs every two to three years so we can keep an eye on it to make sure there's no changes to the shape, the size, and appearance of it. However, if someone has a ruptured aneurysm, it has to be treated, irrespective of the size. The smallest one we had to treat was one millimeter. Largest one we had to treat was three centimeters. So it can vary. This is an animation kind of summarizing the different treatments. I'll let you watch this for a second. One option to treat this is open brain surgery. What you can see here is exposure of the brain by cutting through the skull, dissecting the aneurysm and pinching it off. Just like you, if you have an aneurysm, the ways to fix that, which I'll talk about in a minute. One is open surgery, which you just saw. Second is through the groin, what we do here, where you go through the blood vessels from inside the blood vessel, you go into the aneurysm, and you fill it up with platinum coils just like you patch a pothole. So you level it up. And what your objective is, if it's not gonna fill, it's not gonna bleed. So you fill it up with metal, that doesn't cause a problem. So if it, as long as it's filled up, it's not gonna cause a problem, you're done. The third option is for the small aneurysms that we cannot fix safely, we just try to shut it down, as in shut down the door to the access to the aneurysm. We put a stent across the blood vessel wall and shut down blood supply to the aneurysm. So that's the third option. So this I'll elaborate more in the next few uh, slides. Open brain surgery used to be the norm or the only method of treatment from the 50s, 40s, ever since brain surgery was started till the late 90s. When through radiology, technology came to minimally invasive means where you go from the artery through the, aneurysm, uh, through the blood vessel wall into the aneurysm. The analogy I can give you for that is you have a pothole on the road. What's the best way to fix the pothole? You can patch it. The simplest way is you just get some more concrete, some more mud, patch it and level it. So it's not gonna be uh, concerning anymore. Or you can just avoid uh, pothole formation in the future by forming a new concrete floor or new, new foundation all the way through. So that is open brain surgery. So open brain surgery essentially is you go from outside, expose the brain, expose the blood vessel with aneurysm, you pinch it off, as seen in the graphic right here. Whereas with coiling, you don't have to do any of that sort. You go through the skin, just like a heart catheter, through the wrist or the groin, into the blood vessel, into the aneurysm, and you fill it up. Open brain surgery, essentially the size of the bone you have to take out is approximately two inches. And this bone is put right back. However, you will have a, you will have a scar, you will have some wasting of muscle in the temple, and you'll have a haircut. And this is, an example of some of the clips that are used to pinch off the neck of the aneurysm. This aneurysm right here, blood vessel with a branch going there, that's the neck of the aneurysm or the stalk of the aneurysm. And you can see the, the, the clip pinching it off right now. So the aneurysm is now secured because there's no filling of it anymore. And if it's an elective patient, such as someone has an aneurysm that didn't cause any symptoms or didn't bleed, they want to get it fixed, 
you can get this procedure done with an open brain surgery. You stay in the hospital for up to three to four days, and, it, and you go home, and you might take up to close to a month for you to feel back to complete normalcy because of manipulation of brain tissue. Okay, that's one of the downsides. The endovascular treatment or the coiling treatment, you can appreciate in this uh, series of images, there is the aneurysm right here. That's the rupture point or the daughter sac. You can, uh, you can see that it's not filling anymore. It's got the white stuff in it, which you may not be able to see very well, but you can see it in this picture here is the platinum coils. They're like slinkies. Those are stretched out in tiny catheter tubes like angel hair pasta caliber. And what you do with them is they're stretched out, and the moment they come out of the tube, they take to their original shape, which could be a spherical, a globe, an oval, a peanut shape, whatever shape it is based on the aneurysm. You use those to fill it up, just like you patch a pothole. And it's done by multiple specialists going from the groin or the wrist. And if it's an elective aneurysm, where you do it as an elective means, patients come the day of the procedure, get it done, stay in the hospital overnight, go home the next morning, and they can go golfing or flying the next day. So because you're not opening anything other than a small nick in the skin and going through the blood vessel, the risk of this procedure for recovery time is essentially non-significant non or doesn't really matter. However, if it's a ruptured aneurysm that's treated either way, open surgery or through the groin or the wrist, the patients will have to be in the hospital on average of two to three weeks. With that in mind, the options from um, endovascular surgery, I will not talk more about the open surgery because in this day and age, 95% of aneurysms are fixed from minimally invasive means, and that's what I want to focus on. So depending on the size of the aneurysm, the shape of the aneurysm, the location, and the presence of branches or arteries that are connected to the aneurysm, you can use simple technique like simple coiling, or if you want to use an adjunct supportive device, we call a balloon or a stent, or you can use a flow diversion. All those are different options available. And among these, if anyone needs a stent or anyone needs a, a mesh, these people will have to be on additional blood thinners because you're actually implanting some metal to go along with the coils and aneurysm. And explain, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. This is an aneurysm right here that's looking straight up. That's right behind the artery that goes to the eye. This particular aneurysm is wide. So anything you put in there is probably going to fall down due to gravity or otherwise. It's not going to be secure. So what was done for this patient, this gray area there is an inflatable balloon that's temporary. That was put in addition to the regular catheter to fill it up. So this balloon provided a scaffolding or a temporary occlusion or blockage. We could use that, and we actually packed and packed this aneurysm. You don't see the aneurysm fill up anymore. But at the same time, we did not leave an implantable device like the balloon. It's removed after the procedure. So it's just giving an additional support or extra tools to use for your job. And if you have to use metal, this is an example. This is a pretty wide and a large aneurysm that anything you put in there, it's going to compress these branches or these arteries. That can be a problem. So for that reason, stents were used on this patient. They had to use two of them, one from the left, one from the right, as you can see, overlapping each other. And by doing that, the metal and the stents provide more support for this aneurysm wall so you can actually pack it and fill it up. And this is the actual aneurysm. You can appreciate the stent markers on both sides, left, right, and the proximal part. And the aneurysm is filled with the platinum coins. So this is an extra option. And these patients will have to be in blood thinners for three to six months. And they can stop it after. The newer technology that we're actually using very actively for the last five years is avoiding aneurysm altogether. This is specifically helpful for really small or really shallow aneurysms that are going to be difficult to treat from open surgery or from within the blood vessel. So these are the ones you just try to shut down blood flow to the aneurysm, period. What you're trying to do, as you can appreciate in this particular graphic here, this is the wide aneurysm right here. And a stent was placed on the blood vessel ignoring the aneurysm. We didn't even care about it. We just put a stent to reform the blood vessel wall. And what that did, over six months, it formed a new blood vessel coat over the stent, and the aneurysm is shut down. It's like a grape became a raisin. And this is a stent we use, and we call this flow diversion. This has been in practice for the last five to seven years now, and it has taken over. And because of this, open brain surgeries are essentially uh, almost extinct to the point that we barely do them anymore. 
And the graphic for this, uh, I'll give an illustration right here. This is a video showing how this technology works. You have a white aneurysm in the brain that's filling very briskly right here. So, as I mentioned, this is approximately half to one millimeter in size, diameter-wise. Um, that's threaded up the blood vessel wall. You deploy your support device. It runs a little slow, unfortunately. I couldn't speed this up. And you can see the stent just being deployed outside in the blood vessel wall. There is no touching or manipulation of the aneurysm, so there is no risk of the aneurysm bleeding from this. And once you deploy the device, you remove your whole setup. And an angiogram done right after, you can appreciate the filling is much, much more slower. And over time, this will shrink because there's no mass within the aneurysm. The blood clot will compress and shrink. And as you can appreciate here, that's the object of this procedure. This is very helpful for large aneurysms that cause compression or act like a brain tumor. But it's also helpful for aneurysms that are delicate or friable or in a concerning location, so you don't have to manipulate that aneurysm anymore. So because of this, it has essentially changed the practice exponentially to the point that we don't really uh, consider open brain surgery or do the complex stent with coil, among other things, anymore. The only downside to this technology or the technique that we deal with is that it's a lot more metal than conventional, so there's a very high risk of stroke. So this, these patients have to be on much higher dose of blood thinners for a longer duration. That's the only downside of this. And these are the devices that are just about released or about to be released, and we'll be, in fact, I'll be doing a couple of these next week at Queen's, and we'll be doing more of these in the future. Um, these are called the web device, and they simplify the procedure even more that now we can finish fixing an aneurysm in 30 to 45 minutes instead of the two to three hours. And the technology for this is shown in the next graphic. What you're trying to do is you access a white aneurysm, you go into it just like a balloon or, or an inflatable device, you just release it. It takes its own shape. And if it's an appropriate size, it's good. If it's not an appropriate size, you can remove it and put a new one in. So you can calibrate or check out different sizes to see what fits well. And this, this just takes a few minutes of uh, time. I think the next graphic will show more. Yeah, this is the right size for this aneurysm. And once you know you have the right fit for it, you just detach it at the base with just a simple button. And that, that removes the metal connection and the aneurysm is treated. So with this, you're avoiding placing multiple heavier items. So you're using a very light alloy mesh and releasing it into the aneurysm. So with this, the risks are even lower. And this is one device which is currently in practice in Europe. We should be getting it next year and we, we will hopefully try to use some of them uh, that that could be for eligible patients. This technology is, in fact, uh, um, even more complex. This, this, this is the technique that's going to uh, completely shut down open brain surgery after, after, um, after this device is streamlined in the U.S. And what this would do for aneurysms, which are very wide with branches that are uh, on the side of those aneurysms, we cannot use conventional stents or coils. We deploy this device that kind of looks like a flower bouquet. And what that does, it forms a framework or a structure around the aneurysm wall at the neck. So you can use that to keep the branches open and use another device to fill it up. And that aneurysm is treated. The one downside to all these procedures are, are what you call placement of metal in the patient's blood vessels with the risk of stroke, a problem. And these are not devices that are retrievable. They will be there permanently. So 
in terms of de deciding treatment options, as I mentioned, it all depends on the patient's age, the health status of the patient, aneurysm location, size, shape, and the clinical presentation. Someone is 30 years of age, has an aneurysm due to migraines, has a one, maybe half a millimeter aneurysm, five millimeters, I mean half a centimeter or five millimeters. For someone in that age group, I would probably say with the rupture risk of 1% a year, their lifetime risk is approximately 60, 70%. Compared to fixing it, which is 5 to 7 percent, it's a no-brainer to get it fixed. But someone's 80 years of age has one centimeter aneurysm, and the person is under remission from cancer, has maybe 5 to 10 years of lifespan left, and they have a large aneurysm, do you want to fix it? Probably not, because fixing it is the same risk as Mother Nature, so it's best to leave that be. So all the, these are some examples I can give you where decision is individualized. There is no black or white formula for this aneurysm, you have to fix it, you can't fix it. The only black and white answer we have for aneurysms that need to be fixed are the ruptured ones. The unruptured, incidentally picked up ones that are not symptomatic vary from many factors. And because of the advances in medical research, right now more than 95% of aneurysms and more than 90% of ruptured aneurysms are treated with uh, endovascular or minimally invasive therapies. Uh, open surgery still has some role right now, but the role is uh, shrinking more. It is when aneurysm bleeds and has a large blood collection that's causing compression in the brain. Those are the situations when we still need to open the bone and suck the blood out. But otherwise, beyond that, the chance of actually fixing an aneurysm or pinching it is, is significantly reduced. And the risks of this procedure, what are the risks if someone wants to get an angiogram, someone is to have an aneurysm fixed, what are the risks involved? Half percent 0.2 to 0.5% from an angiogram just to take pictures. It is an invasive procedure. You will be in the hospital. You'll have a catheter placed in your wrist or your groin. So that can carry 1 in 500 or 1 in 1,000, 1 in 750 risk of causing strokes or vessel injury. However, if you're fixing an aneurysm because you're actually entering inside the brain, inside the blood vessel, inside the aneurysm, the risk goes up to 5 to 7%. Younger patients, Bigger aneurysms have a lower risk than older patients and smaller aneurysms. That's kind of an explanation. Open brain surgeries, on the other hand, have approximately 10% in good, capable hands and up to 25% in not so experienced hands of complications. So most of the complications that happen actually could be a stroke because you're manipulating blood vessels. You can have a clot that forms and blocks off a blood vessel in the brain. You can have a tear of the artery. You can have some dye related problems. You can have the aneurysm bleed on the table as you're fixing it, as you're packing it, and very rarely, because of all these factors combined or individually, can lead to death. And that is in the five to seven percent. Most of the risks in these procedures are actually instant or immediate. You see them while they're happening. So there are very few patients. For example, you have a stent placed. They're doing well in the procedure, but a few hours after the procedure, as they're in recovery, they must start to develop a stroke or symptoms like that. That can happen after. But the risks of these procedures are not seen typically 24 hours after. And that's the reason why elective aneurysms that are fixed in the hospital are, despite minimally invasive means with no pain or other involvement, are still in the hospital overnight just for these reasons to be observed. And do we need to follow these patients just because you fixed an aneurysm? If you do a pothole patch up, by just leveling it up, most of the time it stays. Sometimes if it's not a great job or if it's not a perfect mix, it can come back. And that can happen three to five percent of the time. So for that reason, most aneurysms that are fixed tend to, tend to have a requirement for follow-up in six months and two years down the road. And after those two times, if they're looking stable with no concerns whatsoever, they won't need to have any more procedures or any more follow up other than occasional CAT scans or MRIs to make sure they don't develop other aneurysms or there's nothing else that's growing on for that reason. And the implantables, like I mentioned, the coils that are used for aneurysms are platinum based and the stents that are used are alloy based. They are left in the brain permanently. They will not, however, cause a problem. Most of these patients can have an MRI because they're not, they're not ferromagnetic. They can fly. They won't set up a metal detector. They can um, you know, um, do whatever they want to do. They can even go skydiving, scuba diving, because the changes in the pressure would not affect these devices at all. 
And as I mentioned earlier, these will be permanently in the patient. You're not, you cannot retrieve them once they're deployed. So my summary of this talk today is aneurysms are very common, can happen in 6% of the population, and the occurrence of rupture of these aneurysms is very rare. But if they do rupture, survival is pretty bad. One in two die within 30 days. And the recovery typically is only one in three patients with a ruptured aneurysm tend to go back to the normal life or close to normal life with some sort of deficits due to brain injury. The most common risk factor for aneurysms is smoking, and the most preventable risk factor is smoking. And there are no medical treatments for aneurysms. You cannot take any pills to shrink them. You cannot do anything else. You can't do exercises. You can't do any techniques or anything else. That's a structural abnormality. Only to fix them is a structural fix. However, with the advances in treatment we have, minimally invasive means are essentially here to stay. With that in mind, I'm happy to take questions or repeat some of my points that I have, since I kind of spoke too fast. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Safidi. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to have Heather and Sean come around with microphones if anyone has questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sapiri. It's a very interesting lecture. Thank, thank you. you. Um, can you just briefly go over the differences in symptoms between an aneurysm and a stroke and how advisable it is to take aspirin immediately? Good question. A stroke essentially is an abnormality of a blood vessel, and a stroke is a very broad definition. Anything to deal with the blood vessels causing a problem in the brain is called a stroke. 80 to 90 percent of all strokes are due to lack of blood supply, or what you call ischemic stroke. 5 to 10 percent of strokes are hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding in the brain. And of those, majority of them are from high blood pressure within the brain tissue. Aneurysm bleeds, for example, the one is talking about through aneurysms, is only 5 percent of all bleeds. So it's a very rare event. So aspirin would prevent strokes from happening due to lack of blood supply, the 80 to 90 percent of the time. Aspirin is not used for aneurysms. They're only used for aneurysms if they have been treated and they have a device placed. Did I answer your question, sir? Oh, symptoms-wise, they can present the same way, except that someone wakes up with a headache, or someone has weakness in one side of the body. Those are symptoms of a stroke due to brain injury. That could be from a bleed or a lack of blood supply. The only way to know that from, from uh, a patient's perspective is to have it evaluated. At home, you may not be able to know what the differences are, because the only symptoms you have are what your brain is not doing at that point in time. It could be from lack of blood supply. It could be from pressure due to bleed. So you would not know the differences. For you, the symptoms to look for would be brief loss of vision, brief uh, weakness on one side of your body, not all your body, one side of your body, slurring in your speech, difficulty finding words to say. Uh, your vision is either going double or you're actually losing part of your vision, like you cannot see the left or the right side. You're having some balance difficulties. You're having some um, faults or you lost your consciousness briefly. Um, and if you check your blood pressure, it's really high. That's one of the classic signs of a stroke of either kind, either bleed or a lack of blood supply. It's focality in, the, focality in your body, like part of your body is not working properly, you're having speech and language difficulties, and your blood pressure is high. I have three questions. Yes, ma'am. When you're doing the angiogram mm -hmm. and you're putting the thing through the blood vessel, mm -hmm. Does the patient feel anything? No. If we're doing a diagnostic angiogram, which is take pictures, we only go up to the neck. We do not go into the brain. We do not cross the barrier that where the blood vessel pierces and goes to the brain. It becomes thin. We don't go that far in. We just stay at the neck so that patients are awake at that point in time with some IV sedation. Because we're inside the blood vessel wall, they won't feel any pain or discomfort. However, if you're trying to fix an aneurysm or pull a blood clot out from a stroke, they will feel it. So for that reason, those patients are all under anesthesia. Okay. They'll be asleep with the breathing tube temporarily placed. Okay, once you put a stent into the blood vessel, mm -hmm. um, the blood vessel that is connected to whatever part of the body that is, what happened to that part of the body? If, if it's uh, the principle that people say is supply and demand. The brain only weighs 5% of the body, but takes 20 to 25% of your blood flow. It's a very hungry tissue, and it does not have any energy reserves. 
So if there is any prioritization of blood flow that has to happen, it happens in the brain. And when even that is exceeded, that's when you have symptoms like stroke. So if I put a stent across a branch coming out, because there's a need for the blood flow to go through, just like the other way I can describe that would be, if you're trying to get away from the road, you go to a cul-de-sac or a blind alley versus a side lane. Because in the lane there's traffic going through, you're able to get through easily. Whereas with a cul-de-sac or a blind alley, you're getting stuck there, you'll make a U-turn and come back. So when you fix an aneurysm with a stent, it's like a cul-de-sac. It's an end point. So blood doesn't come back from there. So that stagnates. Whereas with the blood flow on a blood vessel, because there's flow and demand, that stays open. And to make sure that it stays open, we give blood thinners for that reason. But well, that part of the body would Correct. longer have blood flow. Correct. So, so because the inner coating of the blood vessel wall has some chemicals in it, for a simplified term, that prevents blood, from, blood clots from forming. That's why we don't have blood clots all the time, unless we have cholesterol deposition or a tear or something else. So a stent is a foreign body that can aggravate and cause blood clots. So by thinning your blood, your blood is a lot more thinner by taking medications, like aspirin, Plavix, among other things. That makes sure that blood flow is there. And over time, the coat that's on the blood vessel wall, the original coat, forms over the stent or over the device that you place. And that's when you can stop your medication after that. Okay. And how it's all you, part of the healing. And how would you treat a ruptured blood vessel? Just with coils. A ruptured blood vessel, we place a stent across it. If it's actually a tear of a vessel, we just place a stent to secure it, like you're providing a skeleton framework for it. But if it's an aneurysm or a blister, there are two ways to do it. You can secure it, but if it's not likely to be secured, you may have to sacrifice the branch by sealing it off and wait for other channels to come from the other side. Like the brain has left, right, and back vessels. They're all connected to each other. When the connections fail, that's when you have strokes. So if you have blockage on this side, the artery that's on this side is connected to the left side. Blood flow goes this way, to the left side. So oftentimes you may have to seal or block off this artery and let the other one take over. So you can do angiograms to see how the blood flow is evolving when there's a blockage or a leak or a tear. So you can appreciate what the anatomy is and based on that you make your you know, um, intervention what you have to. Yeah, doctor, I uh, had a question regarding yes, a person who is in safe good health, mm -hmm. regardless of age, mm -hmm. uh, is he, um, is aneurysm, you know, can he still have an aneurysm? aneurysm? Absolutely. Um, like if you guys watch Game of Thrones, Khaleesi, the mother of dragons, had two aneurysms. So it can happen in anyone. Um, you know, uh, and also to answer the question, I'm going to elaborate that a little bit more. Uh, half the time in clinic, we have this question, what would you do, doctor, for this? It's not my answer. My job is to give the information. The decision about you and your body is you. So what we see is there's, if you take a spectrum, on the left on the spectrum is the patients who have, hey, I'm, I'm in very good health. I have not had a problem. I was picked up to have this aneurysm incidentally. It didn't cause me anything. I don't want anyone to mess with it. If something goes bad, I'll be regretting it. Then on the other end, you have someone says, you know what? I'm always unlucky in my life, or I always get bad things happen to me. I have an aneurysm, no, I cannot live, I can't cough, I can't go fly, I can't do anything else, because if it pops, I'll die. So they have the fear. Majority of the people are in the spectrum between these two. So based on which side of the spectrum you are, you know, if you have an aneurysm, but it doesn't look like it's an ugly looking one in a bad location, you're completely justified in not doing anything about it, because your, your risk of it rupturing is low. But on the other hand, if you're one of those happy go campers who likes to smoke, have a good time, do drugs, have an ugly aneurysm, you probably will have it bleed soon. So you might not survive it. So it varies. Thank you. Uh, in relation to the modifiable risk factor of smoking, is there any data on vaping? And also Unfortunately, on that's a newer um, that's kind of a newer vice, so yeah. to speak. It's also in more younger people than older people. Um, there is data, not from aneurysm perspective, from just blood vessel health in general, that vaping is still not good. But we don't have enough volume or, or duration of experience to comment on vaping causing brain aneurysms or causing rupture of brain aneurysms. We don't. Okay, what about um, any relationship to secondhand smoke? Unfortunately, it's the same as first-hand smoke. 
uh, except that you got a discount on smoking. So um, there is no, unfortunately, as far as, from what I understand on the data, secondhand smoke is as bad as primary smoke. You're just getting lighter doses. So if you have someone who's a smoker, you've heard about that, you may want to put the kabash down. I'm sorry, I'm just being uh, very blunt. <laughs> Okay, doctor, um, my question is this. If you have a family history mm -hmm. of strokes, mm -hmm. uh, and so you, your, your cholesterol and you keep your blood pressure in mm -hmm. good control, mm -hmm. you eat well as mm -hmm. best as you can, and mm -hmm. you exercise, mm -hmm. how big a factor in this day and age is stress? It's a lot more than people give credit for. Because uh, I wasn't born here. I was born in an Asian country. Uh, I was born in India, but I came here at a young age, and I could see, and I lived abroad as well. So I can see the changes in the culture. In that, out here it's a very stressful work demand. If you can't do it, somebody else will do it. Kind of an attitude that that causes a lot of stress. People don't get much vacation time here. People don't get much of a break here, compared to European countries or Asian countries. So stress is uh, uh, what you call it. It's it's the a uh, blind elephant in the room that you can't really see. And stress, unfortunately, is not something you can quantify. People try to quantify it by talking about your blood pressure levels, your cholesterol levels, but there's also a mental health factor to it. So all those things, unfortunately, are too many cooks in the kitchen to, quant to narrow down and say yes or no. But absolutely, I think stress is a very seriously underreported and unreported issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, so I, I understand what you said about the fact that we can't do anything for, in terms of prevention. Mm -hmm. and, but could you explain in lay terms uh, why nothing can be done in terms of prevention uh, as of today? And is there any research being done in terms of what can be done in the future? Or what, where do we hope to go in terms of prevention? Well. Um to clarify that, it's not like you cannot do anything to prevent. If you don't smoke, if you keep your blood pressure in check, you don't do drugs, and you don't do heavy alcohol consumption, you're preventing it in a way, you know? But if you do any of those and you have an aneurysm, your risk is exponentially higher. If you don't have an aneurysm, don't do any of this stuff, there's nothing for you to worry about. And unfortunately, the only way to describe that would be that 6% of population that we talk about is five to seven range, it can vary, it's higher in the Asian population, is they have an abnormal integrity of the blood vessel wall. So irrespective of you not doing anything, just the nature of your blood vessel wall is abnormal, makes you very riskier to have an aneurysm. So there's not much you can do to prevent it, but you can prevent it from rupturing or lower the risk of rupturing by you know, avoiding these modifiable risk factors. But if you are on the 90, 94% of population who don't have that abnormal blood vessel wall integrity and you avoid the risk factors, that's your prevention. So I have an incidental finding of the aneurysm, and mm -hmm. I was wondering about the last endovascular approach mm -hmm. that looked like a... Uh, the web device? Pardon? The, it looked like a... Um, like the, the, the flower kind of a device? No, like a little marshmallow. Uh, let me pull it up here. It's the last endovascular surgery board. This one? No, go back. Oh. I'll actually show the pictures here. That one. Uh-huh. So what does that actually do? Is that like just encapsulating the aneurysm? Like, like a coiling? Correct, correct. So the, uh, the one way I can describe from a physics standpoint is when you're coiling an aneurysm, you have this long stretch of platinum coil. And as you're filling the aneurysm, it takes the space with the least resistance. So it's constantly hitting the blood vessel wall in multiple areas. So it's like poking here, 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 here. Whereas the web device, on the other hand, is a softer mesh, not like a platinum coil, because it's like an inflatable, squeezed-in device. It's much more softer. So it's a uniform pressure. So instead of me poking you like this in multiple areas, I put a constant pressure like this, it's yeah, less annoying to you. So it's less area. annoying to the blood vessel wall. So do you, is there... Um blood thinners that are required for that? Uh, because this is a very new device, um, we are still using the Institutional Research Board, or IRB. So as of now, because it's new and we're learning about it, 
we are putting everyone in breathiness for this, for a short duration. Short duration. Short duration. And once we know that it's actually not causing much clots to form, we might not even need to do it. Okay, one more question. What do you consider a large, you can see a large aneurysm, what size the, is that greater right. than? The definition in the past that used to go was uh, any aneurysm less than one centimeter is a regular aneurysm. One centimeter to two and a half centimeter or an inch is a large. And anything about two and a half centimeters or an inch is called a giant aneurysm. Those were the old terms. They used those because that's when the policies to fix aneurysms went into effect. So they had to fix large and giant. And regular aneurysms, anything above 70 millimeters was fixed. Less than three millimeters was never fixed. And three to seven was an individual decision. But now we have enough evidence and experience to see that aneurysms don't really matter what size they are. If they have to bleed, they will bleed. Like I said, the smallest one we had to fix was a one millimeter. So, so now we just fixed based on a multitude of factors, as I mentioned. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, so you say even though the aneurysm is like one millimeter, you would uh, erupt, right? If it's a ruptured one, we fix it. Okay, so how long does it take the aneurysm develop? Uh, if it's a false aneurysm, like a pseudoaneurysm, they can grow in hours to days. Two days. So uh, but if it, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering if like there's something that like CAT scan or like MRI can. Oh, the procedure? Use. It varies. The diagnostic angiogram, just to take pictures that we go from here to go to the neck, takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes for the whole procedure, going through all the vessels. And fixing that, the way we do that is to go with larger catheters and larger tubes from these arteries. And just like a telescope where you pull the tubes out, we have a smaller tube within it that goes higher up and another tube that goes even higher up, all due to the aneurysm. To place those and then place calls takes an hour or two. So it will be overall two to three hours procedure. Well, I'm just wondering if like the doctor would stop recommending that something that you would check annually to see like... It depends on your risk. If, if you have a family of aneurysms and you have a small one, it's a lower risk. It's probably worth checking it once to every one or two years with a CAT scan or an MRI. You don't have to have angiograms every time. Because as an emergency procedure has its own risks compared to no risk from CAT scan or MRI other than dye. So we do those, especially CAT scans, because they provide pretty good resolution up to one millimeter in size. So we just do CAT scans on one or two years intervals. Okay, we'll take one final question. Okay. Um, I just aneurysms that press that press I'm sorry, um, ma'am. I had a question about um, aneurysms that present like tumors or press mm -hmm. the brain. Uh, would them be an option or would it only have to be a treatment that would let the aneurysm collapse? I missed the part. Uh, if it's a large, large aneurysm like a tumor, yes. would yes. what be? Um, would filling it like we would? You, you can, it? yes. Yeah. Th those are the patients, especially when there's a mass effect factor as it's pulsatile because of the blood pressure and the blood vessel connection, and it's kind of constantly irritating the, the brain tissue, you want to reduce the bulk on it. Those are the patients we tend to do the flow diversion, the pipeline, among things, where you just recreate the blood vessel wall with the stent and ignore filling it. That way it will shrink over time to reduce the mass effect. Yes. But then again, even if it is a large tumor-like mass effect, the main cause, the main reason for the symptoms are because of the pulsations. That's how those patients with the eye problems that are evolving over hours, they rupture because it's constantly growing aggressively. It's the pulsations that irritate the tissue. So when you lose that aspect, or if you make it a solid structure with coils, or if you use a flow diversion like a stent and you avoid the mass effect, or even if you fill it up, if you pack it with something, it's not constantly irritating anymore. It's just a dull pressure. That's much more easy for the brain to handle than a constant pulsation. So that's what we look for. So yes, there are some patients that we had to put calls in large aneurysms causing mass effect. We didn't have a choice. And those patients, because they're bled, we can't put them on blood thinners and put a stent across. We had to just use coils and pack them. So, but we're reducing the inflammation by the constant irritation by just making it a solid structure. All right, how about a round of applause for Dr. Samuel Sapiti? Thank you. Mahalo to Val Milstein for providing our sign language interpretation. Also thanks to Jennifer Moran from the Queen's Comprehensive Stroke Center, as well as Violet Horvath from the Hawaii Neurotrauma Registry Project, who were in the lobby earlier this evening sharing great information and giving you all those wonderful handouts.
Um, mahalo also to our corporate communications coordinator, Sean Ibarra, as well as our Queen's volunteers, Tyler Shiroma and Lan Nguyen. Our next, <laughs> our next Speaking of Health lecture here at Punchbowl is called Advanced Heart Failure, New Treatments and Choices. Heart failure occurs when the heart muscle is unable to pump enough blood to meet the body's needs for blood and oxygen. Of the more than 6 million Americans living with heart failure, about 10% have advanced heart failure, according to the American Heart Association. Patients with advanced HF now have more treatment options that can improve their quality of life. Learn more with Dr. Deep Banerjee, advanced heart failure cardiologist at the Queens Medical Center. What is advanced heart failure? Role of diet and exercise for advanced HF patients, new medications and implantable devices, and heart transplantation. That's Wednesday, July 31st, from 6 to 7 p.m. here at the Queens Conference Center. It is free. You can register online at www.queens.org, click on classes and events, or call the Queens referral line at 691 7117. Thank you so much for attending the Queen's Medical Center's Speaking of Health lecture. Don't forget your parking, get your parking ticket validated and have a wonderful evening.